But for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about programming and mental health research, really thinking about it from a team science perspective. And when I'm talking about programming, in this case, I'm mainly talking about research software engineering. So I know we've had a lot of data science earlier today, and I'll be talking about the intersection of research software engineering and data science. But thinking about some of the digital mental health interventions that have been working on over the last 10 years or so, thinking about software as a medical device, so software that's heavily regulated software, that's an active um, diagnostic or therapeutic intervention. I'll say a little bit about data collection, linkage, standards, interoperability. There's been lots of discussions during the break about interoperability and some of the challenges there. So I'll say a little bit about that. One of my roles is working in the NHS Trust, where I lead a research unit thinking about digital mental health um, and how that can help clinical services. So I'll say a little bit about operational mental health service improvements as well. And tying it all back then to team science and particularly some of the roles that I think are sometimes invisible in some of the digital mental health research that we do. So UX, UI designers, technical project management, comms, and so on. Some of the roles that don't get the same spotlight that some of the academics and clinical researchers do. So at the University of Manchester for the last 10 years or so, I've been working with the digital health software team. We're a team that build web and mobile technologies for mental health informatics research. Actually, as Louise mentioned, we build digital health research platforms generally, but we have a particular focus on mental health. And we work with agile approaches. Is everybody here familiar with agile? Is that a term that's common to people? Okay, some are, some aren't. I'll say a little bit about that later on. And we always work with a very co-design and user research approach as well. So working with the end users of the platforms that we're building, co-designing the approaches, and trying to come up with software that's useful and usable and meaningful to people. As a software team, we're very much embedded within the research team. So we are not like a software consultancy that you might um, contract into a project, who might just come and kind of dip in and out. We build the research from the ground up. So we work with the core research team to write the grant application, get involved right the way through. In terms of tech, we've been talking about R and Python. We also have a whole spectrum of technologies that we use. Um, you name it, we probably use it. Um, we've been going quite a long time. We use, depending on the project, lots of different tech. So I've just got a few slides on some of the projects that we've worked on over the years to give you a flavor of the work that we do. Flintouch was a project that started out about 10 years ago now. It's a smartphone app for symptom monitoring for people who experience psychosis. So it's a smartphone app, Android, iOS, we built the apps, um, and it integrates into the electronic healthcare record for clinicians so that within the clinical record, clinicians can see the data coming through. And the idea is that patients, service users can monitor their symptoms more effectively and clinicians can see the data coming through and hopefully intervene to prevent relapse. Act Assist is another app that we've built. It's a CBT informed smartphone app for people with serious mental illness. It was led by Sandra Butchie. It's been through two trials with the MRC, the Medical Research Council. And again, it's a smartphone app, feeds into a back end platform that allows the data analytics um, to function and then to be exported for further analysis as well. Connect is a new project for us. So it's a Welcome Trust funded project, 12 and a half million pounds from the Welcome Trust to try and use digital markers to predict psychosis relapse. So it's a huge remote data collection project in the first instance, using active symptom monitoring, using smartphones, and passive symptom monitoring, using passive data from smartphones and fitness trackers, pulling all the data together, building an analytics platform, and trying to use those data to predict when an individual is at risk of relapse. I mind something slightly different. Um, so it's an app, a multimedia interactive platform. It's for young people who have experience of online sexual abuse. And it's really using a therapy called mentalization therapy to try and um, improve young people's ability to understand the motives of adults and peers, to try and feel more confident in difficult circumstances, and to try and build some psychoeducational material around it. This is a slightly different project for us. It came out of uh, running lots and lots of focus groups and traditional PPIE activities with young people for mental health. And although they were 
successful and useful. And we got lots of interesting feedback from the workshops and interviews and different kinds of traditional face-to-face -face PBIE. Young people started to tell us that, you know, they found that coming to the university site to sit in a two hour focus group, not really the most exciting use of their time. Um, and they wondered if there was a digital platform that we could build that would enable PPIE to function a little bit better. We also noticed, as is probably familiar to lots of people in the room, that the same kinds of people were attending the PPIE sessions. We were missing large sections of people from attending. So there was not really a great diversity of representation in those groups. So PPIE apps, a bit like Tinder for PPIE, you can swipe left and right in different projects. Um, you can vote on different things up and down. It's not to replace PPIE or the kind of rich feedback that you get from those sessions, but it's just to get some quick and dirty feedback. So a slightly different kind of project then is the core mental health data set project. So this was an NIHR funded project, and the idea is to try and understand the links between physical health and mental health. So we worked with stakeholders, lots of public contributors came to focus groups and sessions, trying to understand what kinds of mental health data people would be willing to share with us. And then thinking about how could we collect that information in standardized ways that would enable us to link it with physical health data later on. And really what we want to do is to build up a national picture of mental health across the UK. So we know that at the moment on the clinical research network, the vast majority of studies are on physical health. There's very little mental health data usually collected in those. If they are collected, they're not collected in standardized ways, and it makes it really, really difficult then to analyze the data. So this project started out live as an NHR grant. It's now being taken forward in the MRC Data Mine project, which lots of you will know about already. Another project that's linked to Data Mind is trying to support routine equity auditing of clinical trials. So at the moment, we know that there's no routine equity auditing of clinical trials on the clinical research networks. It's about a million participants a year. Um, and we know that clinical research data is going to reflect the underlying sample. So if we've got very biased sample, then we've got a problem. So what we wanted to do was to build um, an auditing tool, very simple auditing tool, to display the representativeness of participants in clinical trials across mental health studies. That sounds really easy when you think, oh, we're just looking at sex, age, ethnicity. Actually, when we piloted it in Greater Manchester, loads and loads of studies don't have sex, age, and ethnicity captured to begin with, so it makes it quite difficult. Um, and then thinking about what are the denominators, so what exactly are the expected samples for a local, regional, and national populations and by mental health condition? It's not quite as trivial as it sounds in the beginning. But the overall goal then is to try and identify specific underserved groups within the NIHR portfolio as a whole and then within individual studies so that we can target it at different touch points. It might be during recruitment, we try to reach out to a more diverse sample, or it might be routine auditing across the portfolio overall. This project is in collaboration with MQ, um, and it's looking at the CAMS referral pathway. So when we looked at the research and we talked to people, we discovered that about 25% of people who are referred to CAMS are rejected at the point of triage. So you have lots and lots of young people who go through a very lengthy referral process. It often takes quite a while for referrers, GPs, and school staff to refer people into CAMS. And then they wait for eight weeks or more, and then they're rejected. And they're not always sent anywhere else. So it's really distressing, as you can imagine, for young people, for their families. And we wanted to understand what was going on and what we could do about it. So it's really early stage discovery research in software terms. But what people told us was, we just want a digital platform to be able to tell us what are the options? Where are we in the pathway? Can you give us some notification about when we'll hear about the next step, what the other options are? And so that's where we're at in this project at the moment. We've identified lots of the problems. We've talked to hundreds of people about it. Um, and now we're trying to think about how do we take that digital platform forward and what do we do to get the, to the next stage and support people better? In research, we often talk about PPIE. In software, we often talk about user research. Um, PPIE meets user research, I think, in building digital mental health technologies, creating software that provides meaningful and relevant experiences for everyone. We do an awful lot of user research in the work that we do. We always prototype before we program. It's much less expensive to create design prototypes than it is to pay software engineers to code. It gives users something to play with, gives them a working prototype they can click through, they can give us quick feedback. We can build it in rapid iterations. 
It reduces the programming time for us because we're not building things that's never used and it reduces the bloated code. So you're not building a function that will never be used. <coughs> we do lots of usability testing as well, right through the stages of software development to try and gain usability insights. So we typically track where people are clicking on the screen to see if they're completing the tasks that we give them. We see if they can complete the task, how long it takes them and so on. So it adds some quantitative data to the qualitative kind of discussions and think aloud sessions that we have as well. We know there's lots of people in the world with disability. We try to program for accessibility. We comply with WCAG standards. That's kind of the base level that we need to comply with anyway. But we try to think a bit more broadly about it and build software that's usable for everybody. We try to support assistive technologies. We could do better at that, but we do our best with the resources that we have. Um, and we think about accessibility in terms of content design and development. So agile technologies for people who aren't familiar with them. Really, would, Agile came about because the traditional scenario was that you would talk to a client or somebody who wanted to build a piece of software, they would give you a list of requirements, you'd write them all down, you'd agree the plan, you'd go away for three, six months, maybe build a software product, take it back to them and say, there you go, there's software, and they'd say, that's not what I wanted at all, I want something totally different. So Agile was really came about to try and reduce some of that overhead. So the whole idea is that you build quickly, you build lots of different iterations as you go, you change, you're really adapted to change. And you try and reduce some of the overhead that traditional software processes had. So you build working software over comprehensive documentation and you try and do a very collaborative process rather than working in isolation. So we do say we're agile in the team. We have daily stand-ups. That's where you meet and say what you did yesterday, what you're going to do tomorrow, um, what, and if there's any blockers in your way. And we have three weekly sprints. So we plan in three weeks. We set goals and we review the work and we see if there were any blockers or problems along the way. And we use JIRA, which is technology just to project management, basically. So you create tickets and you estimate how long the work is going to take. But then you put agile technologies into a research landscape and it doesn't quite go to plan. Um, so typically we get involved in research grant application, maybe two years in advance. We specify and cost what we want to do. We report to project milestones. Our collaborators or the researchers, academics depend on us delivering what we said in the grant application. And for software as a medical device, change means overhead. So you have all the documentation and so on to change if you, if you change anything. So it's not quite a perfect match. Um, and there's lots of challenges along the way. Another problem is Agile says, well, working software over comprehensive documentation. But if we're developing software as medical devices, we have a raft of documentation to prepare. There's 82 documents for a submission to the MHRA if you're a class two medical device. We have quality management systems for the software development, really lengthy processes that's on top of the usual research documents, data management plans, research ethics, so on, that you'll all be familiar with. So it's not quite perfect um, in terms of minimizing documentation. We get these questions, which you probably are all familiar with as well. So you'd be sitting in a meeting and you've got the project panel agreed and then somebody has an idea and they say, oh, can you just link this software to the electronic healthcare record? Or can you just pull and link data from routinely collected NHS data? Or can you just link with an external third party? Or can you just gamify it? We get that a lot when we do um, build software for young people. People say, can you just gamify it? Can you just personalize it a bit more? Can you add a simple button to? And that could be anything from, can you add a simple button to run a machine learning algorithm that nobody's ever invented yet, to something entirely different. And can you write a sustainability plan into the grant application? And I think in programming and building software, it's really difficult to build a sustainability plan into a grant application. So we've done different ways in the past at Manchester. We've spun out companies to take forward some of the research. We've extended research grants. We've got multiple grants, one after the other. It's really difficult to predict that and plan that in advance. So I guess some questions for you all. Um, how can we link data more easily? How can we retain engineers, data scientists, programmers against industry competitiveness? That's one of the challenges I face as somebody managing a team of software engineers. I'm constantly losing people to industry because very competitive offer there. How can we be agile, which is really desirable in software. We want to change quickly and yet we're constrained by all these processes. How can we create sustainability plans that are realistic? And how can we adopt a team science approach within what are effectively hierarchical inst institutions in a lot of cases? I'm really interested to hear any solutions to these challenges. 
Okay. And then just an invitation to people here to join us. So I run a digital health reading and research group every Tuesday morning. It's remote by Zoom. Everybody here is welcome to join, dip in and out if you like. And we have user experience meetings, UX meetings on a Wednesday, just for 15 minutes. Everybody is welcome to join those as well, where we talk about all aspects, not just digital mental health, but digital health generally. And just get in touch if you'd like to follow up on anything. Thanks. Um, anyone with thoughts, comments, questions? Yes. Oh, and you have to. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm actually curious as to how you organize your teams. So you're working in an engineering team, but um, are you also closely working with other professionals, like the user uh, research professionals, and so on, or do you sort of work on your sprint and then pass it on to them, and then sort of have a review? Because I have found that we've recently changed it where we have sort of project groups. We have sort of different members from different sides of the fence. So you'll have a data scientist, data engineer, um, a user experience person, a sort of project manager uh, overseeing the sprint. And I have found that even though communication is very chaotic at the beginning, a lot of the sort of issues that you come up with later on do actually iron themselves out in those first two weeks of chaos. <laughs> So yeah, I'm curious as to what your experience is with that and what are your arguments on each side, I guess. Yeah, so historically we were a team of engineers and we didn't have any designers. We outsourced the design and the usability and the, some of the project management was sort of ad hoc from different people at the university. Now the team has technical project managers, product owners, business analysts, testers, quality assurance, UX designers in-house. So we work really closely with them. They join our daily standups. So we've got everybody together. Data scientists are a slightly different group in our center, but we work closely with them across the different projects. They don't attend daily standups and they don't work in quite the same way as us, but they're close enough that we jump in a meeting with them if we need to. We've definitely found that bringing it all into a centralized team is much more effective for us than outsourcing bits and pieces of it or trying to collaborate across different groups. That works better for us. Can I just follow on, but you, to be able to do that, you need to have big grants or sustain kind of grants for a long time, don't you? So for people who are just starting, do you suggest that they start with outsourcing and then building? Or, or find a group to connect to. There's other groups like ours. Okay. Um, so find a group that you can embed yourself in, I guess. I think, I mean, outsourcing is another option. We still occasionally outsource bits and pieces if we have too much work in. Um, We've been growing and growing for the last 10 years. We, we can't keep up with the demand. So I think that's a, a sign that if you're interested in, you know, build your own team, build the people around you. Um, and I would say that's worked for us a lot better than outsourcing you know, it has in the past. It's just much more easy to control and keep on top and deliver to time and target when you've got full control over people and to share knowledge across the team because the design, pass the handover from the designer to the engineer um, is a lot smoother if they're in house and you just bounce back and forth and say that's not the file I need, it's the other one, rather than having to wait for potentially somebody in a different time zone or whatever to get back to you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say I was just blown away by that whole thing because I'm so inspired, particularly around the PPI app um, and the PPI app with co design. So I thought that was amazing. I've just got a couple of questions on it if that's okay. Um, so, first of all, how, how was the experience of how it's different of the PPI app versus like just a Zoom? Because I've tried very hard to sort of make PPI and co-production much more accessible and much more national sort of voices, diverse as much as possible. Um, and by Zoom essentially doing that. So that's my first question, um, the differences between them. And the second one is in the actual app, is it sort of an ad hoc sort of in and out sort of process? Is it all the way through the research stages or is it just the design and sort of dissemination ideas and how does the process work essentially? Yeah, great question, thanks. So first question, the PPIE app is not supposed to replace Zoom or those kind of interactions. You don't get the rich qualitative data from the PPIE app that you will in those more traditional settings. It's not for that. It's much more for kind of quick and dirty feedback. You know, we've got this, question that we're not sure there's going to be any interest in researching what do you think about it do you think it's a yes or a no kind of thing um, one of the benefits of the PPIE app I think is that because we're pulling all the research together we can see trends across time we can see what works and what doesn't work so we're hoping that we'll learn what works and what people like in terms of presenting PPIE opportunities to people because we can see all the metrics coming in from all the different projects that are on there um, and so we're hoping that we'll learn a bit over time as well as to what what works and what doesn't work did I miss a question 
or just does it is it just that one is it more like oh that? it's right through sorry yeah it's right across the lifetime and the nice thing about the ppie app that people really like is that you get updates on the project so you say i'm interested in this project and then you know you hear two weeks later oh we got funding or we're going to this event with it or would you like to join this session um, and that's one of the things that people told us, you know, you go to a PPI workshop often and you never hear again about what happens to research. You might get a thank you for attending the workshop, but then you don't tell us it made an impact in this way. So the idea is the app um, will tell people how it, how their research is progressing. Hi, um, yeah, thanks for inspiring talk about digital health. It's really cool. I just had a quick question, really. I was kind of attracted to your, the last point there, talking about a team science approach. I was just wondering, because that's, bit of a buzzword that I've noticed. I was curious what you, like what, a few small questions. First of all, what, what do you mean by that in terms of working in within a research or hierarchical environment? Second one, have you, is it being considered or tried? And if so, what barriers did you face? And the third, is it, would there be scope to move towards that? Like if you're trying to affect the higher education policy or something, would you then maybe go to the one of the regulators and, and ask them to try and build into things. I'm just curious how it looks on the ground. Yeah, great question. Thanks. So it's something I think we've been doing informally in Manchester for quite a while in that we all work as a multidisciplinary team. So almost all the research I've presented so far is, you know, multidisciplinary. So we've got the engineers working with clinicians and academics and so on. We're, we're adopting it formally within the Welcome Connect project. So I'll keep you posted on how that goes. And I think that's very much in the outset, establishing just some ground rules and setting up a glossary of terms, you know, we work in different disciplines, some of the words mean different things in different disciplines and making everybody aware of that from the outset. I added there within hierarchical organizations because I think there is sometimes still a challenge in that there's a, um, when we work in some of the bigger institutions, there is often an academic, a clinician, and they're often seen as, you know, sort of the leaders of the project, which effectively they often are. But then the, some of the other roles are, are just not recognized as, as much as they should be in my view. So. People, you know, like the UX designers and things like that, they're not always invited to events that they should be invited to or not recognized in the same way, not put on papers, even though they contributed, it's not. Um, and I think we've been really good about doing that at Manchester and it's kind of on the radar now, but I'm not sure that happens universally. Um, and I think it is still a challenge in some of the more formal grant applications where you you can't even apply if you're on a fixed term contract and those sorts of things. Can I follow on with a question while you're thinking about your next question? <laughs> And it's about the uh, sustainability. So can you tell me, do we really need to think about sustainability? Is it possible that, you know, whatever kind of digital app or services that we create can be kind of short lived and that's all right? Mm, absolutely. I think some should maybe be shorter lived than they are sometimes. <laughs> um, but I think one of the problems I see, and this comes from my trust role. So when I work at, um, in the trust and we're evaluating products, often things come through that have no evidence base. And I know there's lots of products that have been through RCTs, really lengthy, expensive RCTs that do have an evidence base and they're not coming through the same pipeline because they've fallen after the grant has ended. There's no funding to sustain them. Digital tech needs to be hosted. It needs some engineers on board to keep it alive. And so I see that gap then of we've got evidence based things that's not being funded. And I see <laughs> commercial products that look really flashy and people think, oh, that looks great or they've heard about it. But actually there's no evidence base. And that's where the, the challenge is for me. <laughs> when, when, you are, when you provide this kind of, you could say like online therapy or, you know, this is a private discussion between the patient the, 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 or the participant and the machine, you could say, how do you check it doesn't go, you know, weird or bad or, or the machine doesn't say anything that shouldn't? Yeah, I mean, it's, make sure of that. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, that's why we have such validation and testing protocols to follow, especially if software is a medical device, then we have to prove it well in advance, um, as well as working with the PPI groups and co-design groups. And But there is formal stages of validation testing along the way as well. Thank you. Uh, my question is about how we can make it more inclusive of older people, like older users. Uh, you've got any... digital tech generally yeah 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 it's a really interesting question and i think it comes up a lot when we talk about digital health and digital tech about which groups are going to be excluded and there's usually older people come up as the, the key group that will be excluded one of the things that we do um at greater Manchester mental health so we've set up a digital navigator program which is a trained group of volunteers to support people if they don't know how to use tech 
not everybody wants to use tech, I suppose that's a starting point. So we can't assume that people want to use it. But if it's skills or confidence or devices, access to devices, they're things we can help with. And so providing access to devices, training people or giving people support if they need it. And that's something we try and provide through the Digital Navigator program that we set up. So training people to support other people. Can I ask another one? Um, can you tell me about how you establish um, kind of constructive relationship with the industry, um, given that you may not have the same goals somehow? So how can young people reach out to people from the industry and get them involved in their project, being confident that they, you know, both both parties want to have the same outcome or not? always aiming for, I don't know, maybe I have a prejudice that I see industry profits. Well, I think that most researchers want, you know, kind of treatment or find research findings. How do you manage or is that your experience? Or? Yeah, I think it's really difficult. So we have worked with some really good industry partners in the past. Um, we tend to get approached by industry partners who want us to typically evaluate their products. So they've built something, there's no evidence base. Can you evaluate it for us and say it's amazing and then we can sell it much better? <laughs> <laughs> and that's typically the research we don't want to do. <laughs> um, but we have had some really fruitful collaborations with the industry. So um, we have evaluated some products that we think, you know, we've kind of done a pre-evaluation. Oh, this is amazing. And we kind of want to support them because they've got the same goals. It's very ethical. They've got the same goals as us, but they don't have that academic research background. And then I think we've got a, almost a duty to try and get those products, you know, more widely used because there's so few things out there that are. Um, so we do work like that. I think there's also quite a lot of skill and in industry that we can learn from. I talked about outsourcing previously. It wasn't the right solution for us, but we have learned through outsourcing projects previously, you know, how they do it this way. That's quite interesting. Is there, Could we learn some techniques and things from, from that? So their collaborations have worked for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day.